the Senate presidency was, was very long and, and involved a lot. Can you kind of give us a little bit of that history of what happened before he was governor, before he ran the first time against President Ford, and what, what were the significant events? Well, it's one of the things that Reagan had going for him. When he became president, he had a movement. He, he was known to millions of Americans for a very long period of time, not just because he was in 53 mostly B movies in Hollywood, although that was not an insignificant audience. But the fact is, in the course of his Hollywood career, he underwent a conversion, uh, a political conversion from liberal Democrat, who, as they say, voted for FDR, voted for Truman. I think Ike was the first Republican he voted for, but he didn't change his registration until the 1960s. But the fact of the matter is, he was by his own, he used the word, he said, I was, a he I was not only a bleeding heart liberal, I was a hemophiliac liberal. <laughs> And, and I guess they must have staunched the blood flow somewhere because uh, by the late 50s, he was working, his movie career was over, he was working as spokesman for General Electric, traveling the country, which was a kind of campaign in many ways, um, giving what became known as a speech. And the speech must have been given hundreds of times. Uh, in it, Reagan outlined his basic values, his convictions, his fear that government, uh, with the best of intentions, was all too often producing the worst of results, that it was the enemy of innovation, private enterprise, uh, and the like, and, um, and at the same time, upbeat, optimistic. Um, again, conservatism in the 20th century, you know, Herbert Hoover, um, it was angry. Uh, Barry Goldwater, uh, who is in many ways seen as the godfather, I think, of the modern conservative movement. But people tend to forget. They think about the later Goldwater. But Goldwater in 64 was, was running, in many ways, a, an angry campaign, and quite frankly, a campaign that, in the South at least, was flirting with the uh, racists. And uh, Reagan had this extraordinary gift. Um, he made, in some ways, a career out of being underestimated, which worked to his advantage in a number of ways. In 1965, he was approached um, by some conservative businessmen in L.A., mostly, who wanted him to run for governor. And the great line, Jack Warner said, uh, Ronald Reagan for governor? No, no. It's like Jimmy Stewart for governor, Ronald Reagan for best friend. <laughs> um, well, Reagan turned out to be both. And by his own admission, he knew very little about the mechanics of government. He had a somewhat rocky first term. Um, but he won in 1966. Remember where this country was in the mid-60s. Reagan, again, one of the ironies of Reagan, this very sunny, optimistic, forward-looking figure who is in many ways a byproduct of a rather sour, uh, fearful popular mood um, in the wake of the Civil Rights Revolution, the, the gathering women's movement, um, uh, a number of other movements that have since transformed our culture, uh, unhappiness over the war in Vietnam, uh, a growing sense that the great society, uh, though well-intentioned, was falling short of delivering what it had promised. So um, campus unrest, I think everyone's, most of you are old enough to remember, some of you may have been part of it. Uh, in any event, um, America in the mid-60s, there were a lot of people who felt then, and for 40 years, have felt the 60s were the defining decade. There are people who believe the 60s were a period of, in the broadest sense of the word, liberation, long overdue, recognizing all sorts of groups who had been marginalized in our society. Um, there were other people who believed that the 60s represented a breakdown of traditional values, including the family itself. Reagan clearly tapped into the latter camp. The latter camp had enough of a majority to elect Richard Nixon in 1968, um, to elect Ronald Reagan in 1980, to elect a Republican Congress in 1994, and uh, so Reagan rides the crest of this, of this wave. 
but he is an unconventional conservative. He was a principled pragmatist, and that is not an oxymoron. In 1976, he runs against Gerald Ford for the Republican nomination. Ironically, because it was Reagan who popularized the 11th commandment, thou shalt not speak ill of another Republican. Um, asterisk, unless it was Gerald Ford, uh, or unless he had happened to be appointed to the presidency. But you know, two weeks before the convention, this uber conservative announces his choice of vice president. Richard Schweiker, a liberal senator from Pennsylvania. Sheer pragmatism, some would say cynicism, designed to do one thing, crack open the Pennsylvania delegation. It didn't work. But it did suggest something about Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan had been, in his Hollywood days, president of the Screen Actors Guild. As an old union president, he knew something about negotiating across the table from tough adversaries. And he always said, if I can get 80% of what I want, I'll call it a victory. Now, there are some true believers who, who think that unless you get 105%, you haven't got a victory. And I don't think they understood Reagan then. I don't think, I'm not sure they understand Reagan now. Talk a little bit about, uh, Richard, the 1980 campaign. They got off to, the campaign got off to a very, very slow start and then gathered steam and had a tremendous finish. But, but speak yeah, well, they, a little bit about some of the challenges. Yeah, of that remember campaign. what the, again, where we were in 1980. I mean, Lord knows we have been going through and are going through tough times economically. But people have very short memories when they call this the worst situation since the Great Depression. The fact of the matter is, imagine a country with almost double-digit unemployment, with interest rates topping out at 21%, the highest since the Civil War, with double-digit inflation, um, plus the energy, various energy shortages slash crises. Um, that's what Jimmy Carter brought into the 1980 election. And then on top of it, you had the uh, Americans who were being held hostage in Tehran by uh, the, the Iranians enthralled Ayatollah Khomeini. So you had this growing perception. It is an article of faith in this country, whether you're a Republican or Democrat, that the future is going to be better than the present that your children will have a better opportunity, um, that America will be fairer, freer, more prosperous tomorrow than it is today. History is an escalator, not a revolving door. And in 1980, we were in a funk. We had begun to lose that confidence, which means we'd begun to lose confidence in ourselves. So that was the political climate uh, under which the Republicans nominated Reagan. Uh, you're right, the fall campaign, whoever was thinking of the symbolism or not, he started out in Mississippi, was it Mississippi? Mm -hmm. um, in, a, uh, in a community replete with racial overtones, memories from the civil rights movement, and he and Reagan talked about states' rights, uh, which is a very charged, phrase, particularly there. Um, and it was, just a, it was just kind of a bizarre way to begin the campaign. Um, on the other hand, Reagan had something going for him, low expectations. There were millions of people who on election day, I think, voted for Ronald Reagan, not necessarily because they bought into supply-side economics. I mean, Reagan did something in 1980 that candidates don't do. Reagan had a program, and it was pretty specific. He had an agenda, he had a platform. He said, if you elect me, I will do this. This is my plan for the economy. Less government, lower taxes, a whole host of incentives uh, for the entrepreneurially inclined, a huge buildup in the defense budget. Um, Reagan who, like all transformative leaders, lived in a world of his own imagining, sincerely believed that he could cut taxes, 
radically, um, increase defense spending, and balance the budget. Uh, and in many ways, the story of the Reagan presidency is of the somewhat painful discovery, I can do two of three, but I can't do three. And he decided that he would do two of three and he would weave the balanced budget. There would be a peace dividend if we won the Cold War, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And 30 years later, we are, we are dealing with the consequences of that. But in 1980, there was one debate. There were two debates. Jimmy Carter did not choose to debate with Reagan and the third party candidate, Johnny Anderson, who uh, was a moderate Republican. Um, and uh, Reagan did fine in the first debate. And remember, Reagan, here is the, the parallel. I would not exaggerate the parallels between Obama and Reagan. But strategically in 1980, as in 2008, the challenger had the same test to meet. He had to demonstrate to a skeptical electorate that he had the training, the temperament, the background, the instincts. People call it experience, but it's not experience in the sense that if you were looking at a resume, you were looking to hire someone. It's different. It's, it's you know, this guy's going to come into my living room 24-7 now for the next four or eight years. Am I comfortable with him? And Reagan used the debate with Carter to do that. And, How? And that was exactly. Um, Carter was Carter. Carter was undoubtedly better informed, undoubtedly better briefed, uh, undoubtedly he had more facts at his fingertips, and it didn't matter. Because Reagan, with his instinctive grasp of what the American people needed to hear, when Carter attempted, for example, to turn back against Reagan, uh, things he had said in the past about voluntary Social Security or opposing Medicare, um, all of which is, you know, factually uh, documentable. And Reagan just smiled, you know, there you go again. I mean, it's just kind of a, a genial, I refer to him in this piece as a genial fundamentalist, which is an oxymoron when you stop to think about it. But, but it's, it's, it begins to convey the complexity. Ronald Reagan was a complex man who appeared simple. Um, and he, and, and in any event, what he did in that debate was twofold. Reassure people that he wouldn't be trigger happy, that he wouldn't start a nuclear war. That's the first thing you need to do if you want to get elected president. Um, and second, he managed to connect to people. In his closing statement, brilliant, he said, are you better off than you were four years ago? When you go to the market to buy things, are they cheaper? Is it easier for you to get gas? I mean, these questions that don't get incised on granite walls, but which absolutely reach people where they live and ultimately where they vote. So I, I think, and I think with all due respect, I have great admiration for President Carter and I think he's done extraordinary things as a former president, but 30 years later, he still doesn't know what hit him in, in, in that debate because he was approaching it intellectually in a cerebral way. And, and from where he was coming, he had the facts at his side, he had the facts on his fingertips, and Ronald Reagan was this kind of genial snake oil salesman.